Pledge of Allegiance is stupid. It makes no sense. It's a cloth. Go outside and touch grass. Okay, but like, let's talk about this. There was this stupid thing that I used to say when I was younger that I didn't want to leave this earth without being able to say that I'm proud to be an American. And I was maybe like 16 or 17 when I realized that's never gonna fucking happen because this country is constantly taking my rights away along with the rights of a bunch of other people and then wants to tell us that we're free because other countries have it worse. That's quite literally like shooting someone in the foot and then getting mad at them for being upset and telling them I could have shot you in the head. Like, bitch, you still shot me, like what? Why the fuck would I pledge my allegiance to that type of country? Are you kidding me? Do y'all even know what allegiance means? It means loyalty or commitment of a subordinate to a superior. I wish the fuck I would. And I don't make my students say it either. I don't make them stand up for it, say it, none of that. Because why the fuck would I? Throw the whole pledge out, the whole thing. Did you see that the FBI raided Trump's home? They've clearly fallen to the leftist agenda. The FBI, the organization that tried to blackmail and threaten Martin Luther King Jr. because they believed there was a chance that he was a communist, has used 9-11 as an excuse to unjustly target and spy on Muslim communities and individuals, and has an extensive history of infiltrating and surveilling civil rights movements in attempts to disrupt and discredit them. Those guys are left wing now. Yes, we need to defund them. You know what? I agree. Wait, you do? Yeah, well, they've obviously joined the radical left gazpacho. Okay, really? Careful, they might send you to the goulash. Maybe if we wait just a little bit longer, a fuck will fall into my hand and I can give it to you. So you know how everybody seems way more scared about monkeypox than they were about COVID because monkeypox can affect your physical appearance? So we were positive my mom had monkeypox this week. She'd been sick for a while, she had every single symptom, and she started developing some little lesions on her face. She went to the doctor, turns out she doesn't have it. That's not what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me is that when she said, I think I might have monkeypox, my first thought was not, oh no, you might be sick. My first thought was, you might finally get to experience the world the way that I've experienced the world. My mom is gorgeous. She's been gorgeous her entire life. She's absolutely benefited from pretty privilege, even if she can't recognize that. I grew up with a facial difference. Some people will say facial deformity, but in the community we say a facial difference. Mine is called a hemangioma, and it's a bunch of extra face veins that continue to grow and multiply as I age. It's the extra meat in my cheek here, extra meat in my lip, it's blue discoloration, there's blue discoloration all in here. I've had many, many, many surgeries on it, and I will continue to have surgeries on it for the rest of my life. I've had multiple large tumors, large masses removed from my face and my neck throughout my life. And I've just now gotten to the point where I've learned to apply makeup in a way that when I go out in public, people won't ask me about my face. When I don't wear makeup in public, every time I leave the house, a stranger will come up to me and ask me what happened to my lip or tell me that a pen exploded all over my face or ask me if I'm okay because it looks like I got punched in the mouth. And those comments don't bother me. They never have because I've never experienced the world any other way. And the only reason I wear makeup in my videos is because people don't watch my videos unless I have a face of full coverage foundation on. If I post the same exact video, one wearing makeup and one not wearing makeup, the first one will maybe make it to 500 views, whereas the one with makeup could make it to 800,000 views. And some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, people treat me a lot better when I have a full face of makeup on too. That's a pretty universal experience. And I remember a conversation I had with my mom a few years ago when I was trying to explain to her this concept that the two experiences that we've had as people who wear makeup are vastly different experiences and it's just not something she could grasp and it might not be something that you could grasp but I'm not going to try and waste my time explaining it to you because it's not something you can understand without having had the lived experience that I've had and that other people who don't have pretty privilege have had and I fully recognize that when I look more like this I have way more pretty privilege than many of my peers in the community have. I've also had the privilege of a lot of high quality medical care and surgeries that many people with my condition or similar conditions don't have access to. I've also had experiences when I was younger of walking through a grocery store and a child seeing me, seeing my face, and running to hide behind their grown-up because they were afraid of the way that I looked. And that's the difference between your experience and my experience. So when you're talking about monkeypox and saying things like, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my face card or whatever, what many of us here who don't have the privileges that you have had, we hear you say, I'm afraid I'm going to look like you.
I just had an abortion. Oh my god, that's so controversial and it's such a private event. Why would you talk about it? Fuck you. I didn't know what to expect because nobody told me. I had a vague understanding of the symptoms, of course, but the filthy fucking details? So I'm here to inform you and any conservatives who are watching who literally have no idea how this shit works. It is one of the most traumatizing things I have ever experienced. I will talk about the emotional repercussions, but first I'm gonna talk about the physical. Because anybody who says that people are getting abortions as birth control is either misinformed or a fucking monster. Within 10 minutes of taking the medication, I was on the toilet, shitting my guts out and vomiting at the same time. I told you, filthy details. I was given nausea medication, but this wasn't nausea. This was due to intense pain from my cervix being forced open that was so bad my body did not know how to react. This stage lasted for four hours. And at about the four hour mark, I feel the lining of my uterus slough off. And for the next four hours, I would go through a cycle of intense, unbearable pain, a piece of tissue about the size of a lime coming out of my body, and then about 15 minutes where I was no longer in pain. Rinse and repeat. I don't remember a lot of that day because I spent most of it trying not to pass out. And to add insult to literal injury, I had to travel out of state for this. We knew we caught it early, but we didn't know how far along, and we live in Texas, which means there's a six-week ban. Or at least, for now, it's a six-week ban. But even though we caught it really, really early, we decided to just be safe and travel. And I measured in, when I got there, at exactly six weeks and one day. I tested out of pure paranoia because I was two days late. Two. If you think six weeks is a reasonable amount of time, off you fuck, thank you, goodbye. Hmm. Funny. Yes, but not funny, haha. -ha. Funny weird. <laughs> Call Trump what you want, but a poor showman he is not, because he definitely saved the best for last. If you went back in time and told me one week ago that he had something in his sleeve that would make me completely forget about all the January 6th stuff for a while, I would call you a liar. Because what could possibly be more dangerous than his attempt to overthrow democracy? I don't know, how about destroying the world? Because it's being reported that the FBI, when they were raiding him, were looking for nuclear weapon secrets. <laughs> what? If you've never been in the military or worked with the government in any capacity in which you had to interface with secret technology, it is not something that you can just accidentally take home. And especially not the highest echelon of top secret stuff. We don't even keep that stuff on digital record. It's inside of a bunker, which has a smaller bunker inside of that. And you have to go through multiple levels of security in order to get a box full of paper with the secrets, which meant at some point he went and obtained a box of nuclear weapons secrets and then just took it home to his golf course. And fun fact, the president can make Almost anything unclassified, except nuclear weapons secrets based on a law from 1954. Sometimes things are like national security risk. And sometimes it's like, m well, maybe if these series of unlikely events happened, it would cause a risk to our country. And then there are other things which are direct existential threats. Like, I don't know, our nuclear arsenal. You know that thing that's keeping the entire world in check from using their nuclear arsenal? It's called mutually assured destruction and it's really important that they don't understand all of the intricacies of what ours can do. Now it would be really bad if you took those wildly important documents that were keeping everyone from nuclear war and you just left them in the back room of a golf course. But it would be even worse still if you took those documents to, I don't know, sell them? 
you guys remember when he was running for president and everyone was like, hey, we have this emoluments clause because it's really bad when you let a politician who has a bunch of debts near secrets because they might sell those secrets to pay off those debts. <laughs> I don't know I brought that up. No reason. And this is such a massive thing that I wasn't just going to accept unsubstantiated reporting about it until he went out and called it a hoax. It's a hoax, just like Russiagate and just like my two impeachments. And it's like, oh my God, he's admitting to it. Because anyone who's been paying attention to the man for the last five years knows that when he calls something a hoax, it's absolutely true. But he couldn't even stay on that because he immediately pivoted to Barack Hussein Obama probably took home weapon secrets too. This isn't something you walk away from, and it's probably worse than we thought. <laughs> Buckle up. Oh, and hey, I was right about him. I was right the whole time. Mega Max, what are your thoughts on the FBI raid on Trump's residence? First and foremost, there's three words that come to my solemn mind. Deep state. This event is predicted, political, peanut. Rhyme scheme, on point. Wait, didn't Go Trump ahead. appoint the director of the FBI? Um, some might say he did on a sad day. A very, very sad day. And on that sad day, some may also say... This was a lookalike of Trump himself a look -alike. that you can hire to come to your birthday party and impersonate Trump. Himself. Wait, this is not a microphone. For sure. That's all. And truthfully, this is an overstep and needs to be responded with the pulverization, annihilation and blending of the FBI itself. Check yourself, Americans. Do you identify with this country? Imagine if the FBI raided yo mama's house, yo dad's house, yo sister's house and yo dog's crib in the back of your house. First, get a jar. Patrick, that's a pickle. Yes. Let's talk about how the iOS v Android debate is a class issue and how this is especially true for younger millennials and elder Gen Zers who grew up during the period of time when the first iPhone was released. Because the thing is, back then, iPhone was the only option. And for many years, even once other options became available, it remained very clearly the best option. And as such, it was also a status symbol. Something I very clearly recall from growing up during that time is the blissful ignorance of some of the wealthier suburban kids in my social circles who assumed that everyone's parents could afford whatever any of us wanted. And so they would come and ask, why don't you have the iPhone yet? You actually like your flip phone? You like that Android? Let's debate about it without realizing that no one wanted an Android back then. Everyone wanted iPhone. Not all of our families could afford it. And this is no longer true today. There are Android options today that are just as expensive and luxurious as iPhone, but it remains true today that if you don't have a certain level of financial means, Apple does not make products for you because a big part of their branding strategy, as I see it, is maintaining their position as a status symbol and perpetuating all of our understanding that Apple products are not for poor people. And that is the unspoken part. Those are the memories I have that I don't think I will ever fully be able to get over when this debate comes up. I want you guys to look into this study, okay? So apparently there is an increase in single lonely men. And it's not because of anything that these Andrew Tate or Kevin Samuels like figures are saying in which they claim that it's because of a lack of alpha males or because like women just don't respect men enough. 
It's literally because women don't like getting treated like dog shit. If you don't believe me, it's actually in the study itself. Boom, there it is. Dating opportunities for heterosexual men are diminishing as healthy relationship standards increase. And another little bit, women prefer men who are emotionally available, good communicators, and share similar values. All of this time in which women have been saying that they don't want to date men who are emotionally unavailable, who don't share their same values, who are just generally speaking horrible human beings, what, you, you just thought that they were joking? <laughs> you actually thought that people wanted to date you being the physical manifestation of a landfill. No, they don't want that. And it doesn't matter how good you look or how alpha you are, you know, people don't want to date other people who are horrible human beings, you know? And we're going to continue to see this trend of more single lonely men if we do not humble ourselves and start treating other human beings well. There's a video going around of a mother hitting their autistic child because they don't want to get into the pool. I'm not stitching it because I don't want to show that. But something we need to stop doing is forcing autistic kids to do things that they don't want to do. Just because their holistic or neurotypical peers are doing it does not mean that they have to be doing it as well. In this case, something like swimming may be the desirable activity for the parent, but it could cause the child harm. Autistic people have sensory differences, so the water could have even been painful for him, as well as the people talking, the temperature, or the sunlight. If families want to do activities with their autistic kids, they need to listen to their kids and accommodate them, not get them to do things that they can't or don't want to do. It's your chillin' repeat at the meet at that party. It's not Atlanta. No, it's not Atlanta. Lights on you. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. clay coat. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. Decatur. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. Gwinnett. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. Roswell. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. Fort Paul. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. Lindburn. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. nope. the North. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. the South. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. you niggas. It's not Atlanta. No, nope. you bitches. It's not Atlanta. Good morning, bad news. The United States Senate is a corrupt, anti-democratic, obstructionist, and failed institution whose only purpose is to kill good ideas when those ideas threaten billionaires and corporations. The Senate was originally created to keep power in the hands of rich white male landowners during the establishment of popular democracy in the United States. And the Senate should have been abolished in 1820 when it became a deliberate compromise on preserving slavery. But instead, it's been elevated as the most powerful institution in American government and is directly responsible for this country's current political, social, and economic failures. The Senate has no place in our legislative system and should be abolished as soon as humanly possible. In fact, most other countries that have grappled with the failures of similarly powerful political aristocracies tend to reduce them to ceremonial roles that don't have any real power, like the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. But in the United States, our rich white elderly cabal of power brokers have unlimited minority veto power over efforts to reform institutional failures. The Senate is the reason we can't pass voting protections, marijuana legalization, universal health care, student loan debt forgiveness, a minimum wage increase, or any other ideas that if offered as a vote to the American people would pass with nearly unanimous support. Even the Senate itself isn't ruled by its own majority. As we've repeatedly seen, the filibuster rule means that 40% of senators can single-handedly kill popular legislation. But the answer isn't to repeal the filibuster rule, it's to repeal the Senate. Because fundamentally, having an upper chamber of Congress that's based on the number of states, not the number of people, means that where people live is more important than what people want. We didn't even get to choose our own senators until 1913. It is historically, and currently, perhaps now more than ever, an anti-democratic and totally unnecessary institution. We are watching in real time as individual senators subvert the explicitly stated will of the American public through petulant and open corruption. A multi-millionaire coal baron who lives on a boat is single-handedly preventing an absurdly overdue transition to clean energy. A bizarrely overrepresented political class of white supremacists are eagerly voting against holding criminal proceedings for crimes of insurrection that we all saw happen live just months ago. There is a blatant disregard within the Senate for representing the country instead of representing the interests of the ultra wealthy and the companies in which they hold stocks. Because that's where Senate members make their outrageous fortunes while serving public office. And as time goes on, the number of people actually represented by the Senate is shrinking to effectively zero. Within two decades, less than a third of the country will hold 70% of the power in the Senate, and demographically, they will be white. While the United States continues to evolve into a multicultural society where 
the majority is no longer mono-ethnically white, the Senate is nowhere close to reflecting the rest of the country. In the last 230 years, nearly 2,000 senators have wielded power in the United States. Only 11 of them were black, and five of them were Barack Obama, Tim Scott, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, and Raphael Warnock. The average senator is 64.3 years old. Two-thirds of them are millionaires. 89% are white, 76% are male. By comparison, the average American is 38 years old and makes $47,520 a year. The United States is 60% white and 49.2% male. But you don't need those numbers to already know that the Senate doesn't reflect the average American. It reflects the wealth class of the United States and its relentless grip on power at the expense of everyone else. The Senate is a malignancy, a defensive wall against progress, equality, and justice in the face of a society that's been exploited by the wealth class for the entire history of this country. Abolishing the Senate isn't a radical idea. It's the last sensible idea we have to keep America from total collapse, while senators actively siphon every drop of wealth and power from the American people to their friends and donors. Thanks for watching Good Morning Bad News. If you want to see all of our scripts and sources for this episode 100% for free, or if you just like this channel and want to help support us and get this mug or these stickers as a thank you, you can find us on Patreon. The link's in the bio. Oh fuck yeah, new D&D &D filter. This is a hate crime. I did not know that overdraft fees were created in 1990 and credit scores were created in 1989. Thank you, Nina Turner, for pointing out that we can live without them. We keep it a stack. Overdraft fees and credit scores was really just created for financial gatekeeping and for keeping particular people outside the economy while always already sustaining people's position inside of it. This is how social constructs are created. Shit happens out of thin air and then over time, off of practices and procedures and norms, society just agrees it's a thing. And now here we are, 22, 32 years later, paying overdraft fees. Gatekeeping for real, think about it. Credit scores are literally used to filter what type of house you can buy. Prior to 1989, how was y'all doing that without credit scores? It might sound crazy to some of y'all, but this makes sense to me, man. Nina Turner, you own this for two. We should do away with overdraft fees and credit scores because they're getting in the way of us being able to thrive and survive. God, are you kidding me? What do you think I learned all this it's shit? It's just a cigarette and it cannot be that bad. Girl, you know. When your leftism doesn't come from a love for people, it shows. This reminds me a few years ago of how white male leftists on TikTok would come on here to debate with white male conservatives. And though so many of us praised their content, I think they're actually a perfect example of what this creator is talking about. If you look closely at the origins of their perspective and the vibe of their community, it ironically mimics the alt-right pipeline. For so many white male conservatives, their journey to the alt-right started with content like that. Feminist gets owned, feminist theory gets destroyed. Content around dominance of political ideology rather than social issues that that ideology is actually based off of. And these white male leftists had a very similar vibe. It felt like these leftist creators were just using these debates as a grudge match, an excuse to destroy or own their conservative opponent. Their leftist ideology was never born of a love for people. It was born out of vain self-interest to flaunt their intellectual superiority and prove that their political ideology was more dominant than a conservative one. The damning thing is when a lot of black and brown creators, some leftists and some who just wanted to call out their lack of intersection sectional theories uh, or the tokenization of black and brown people's experiences, women's experiences that they would be talking about in their debates, these white leftists leaned into their sense of elitism and tried to say that those perspectives were invalid because they were not academically insightful enough. They argued that these creators had no room to criticize them because they didn't study or understand the academically codified leftist theories like they did. The thing is, you don't need to understand a theory for your perspective to be valid, especially when you are living the life that that theory is based off of. And any true leftist with a love for people and a sense of empathy would understand that. But that's not what these white male leftists were. Truthfully, they're not that different from their white male conservative counterparts, just another side of the same coin. Their sense of elitism was just academic and came from their knowledge of theories rather than propaganda, but it gave rise to the same idea of political dominance and the same lack of empathy and love for people.